So uh, first of all, we would like to thank and welcome everyone um, this morning, evening, afternoon. This is our seventh Snow Leopard Network webinar. And I'm Justine Shanti, and I'm the ED for the network. And today we're going to focus on genetics and its role and potential for snow leopard research and conservation. And it is with great pleasure to introduce our two guests, Uma and Byron. So Dr. Uma Ramakrishnan is Associate Professor and Senior Fellow at the National Center for Biological Sciences in Bangalore. She has a wealth of experience working on tigers and particularly she has pioneered gen genetics as a tool, a conservation tool for carnivores, uh, research and conservation itself. She also collaborates with many teams that are working on snow leopards across the range, including the PAWS efforts. And she is a highly sought after speaker. So I'm really thrilled that she's come here to, today to join us. And we also have Dr. Byron Beckworth, who's the director of Panthera's Snow Leopard and Conservation Genetics Program. So Byron has worked throughout the Snow Leopard range and has been really instrumental uh, throughout his career, bringing attention to genetics and snow leopard conservation. And I know that capacity building is also very close to his heart. And at the moment, many of you might know that his team, uh, along with Panthera and Jan Janeka and others, are giving us LN members a kind of focused training on genetics this month. So thank you, Byron, for also doing that for SLN members. So Uma will be giving us the main presentation and Byron has kindly agreed to facilitate the rest of the entire session. So this gives me a little break. So I'll pass it over to Byron who will facilitate the rest. And from all of us at Snow Leopard Network, thank you all for joining us together today and thank you, a special thank you and welcome to our speakers. Hey, thank, thank you. Thanks so much, uh, Justine and Rocky, for organizing this. And yeah, no, I'm, I'm really excited to be seeing Uma's talk. Uh, first, I'll just lay, in, lay a little bit of the ground rules for, for how we're proceeding. It's going to be about an hour. We're looking to, to close this up within an hour. We'll start with um, a chat uh, or, or just a presentation from Uma. Um, I think it's, it's going to be about 20 minutes. Is that right? Uh, yeah, maybe 20, 25 minutes. Let's, I'll try to finish. Yeah. There are liberties to go longer, of course. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, so just, just so everyone's aware, this is being recorded. If you happen, if, if you have an issue with that or any concerns, you can go ahead and please uh, contact Rocky and, um, and, and, and address those with her. Uh, otherwise, we're hopeful that this will be available for those folks who can't uh, tune in right now. Uh, what my role is gonna be is help funnel all the things towards uh, uh, Uma so she can focus on the task at hand. And so if you have questions throughout this, feel free to put them in the chat. I'll be concatenate all those into a, a document that we'll then get to at the end of Uma's presentation. Um, and of course, as, as after she ends, if someone wants to come onto the video and, and ask in person, that's encouraged too. But I, at the very least, if you're uncomfortable or your bandwidth isn't that great, feel free to write your questions in, in the chat and I will make sure that those get addressed by Uma, um, given that we have enough time. Hopefully there'll be a lot of good questions. So yeah, with that, I'll, I'll, I won't take up any more time. I'll hand it over to Uma. Um, whose title is Using a Genetic Lens to Understand um, Endangered Species. So thanks, Uma. Thank you. Thanks, uh, everyone, Justine, Raki, uh, Byron. Thanks for being here and all of you for uh, coming to listen. You know, it's Friday evening here in India uh, and some part of Friday everywhere. So um, I know that there's a lot of demands on our time. So thanks very much for coming. So I'm going to start uh, sharing screen. Um, so, um, you know, basically, as, as, as Justine mentioned, um, I've, I've done a lot of work over the last uh, many years with my lab. Uh, I mean, a lot of everything I talk about, I mean, pretty much nothing I've done. Uh, it's all a huge team effort. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's been a lot of work on tigers. So I'm sorry if I'm going to go back and forth with examples. I've tried to put in a few other uh, examples today. But what I'm going to try and do is to convince you that, you know, uh, on one hand, uh, you know, everywhere, all we read about are these devastating, you know, predictions for biodiversity and biodiversity loss. Uh, and it seems like a very dismal uh, situation and scenario. But on the other hand, what's happened in the last 10 years or so is that there's been a huge growth in technologies 
uh, for looking at DNA sequence. Uh, and this uh, you know, revolution in genomics has really allowed us to access a lot more data than we could before. So that's, of course, that's exciting uh, for a data junkie, but we need to also ask, how does this really aid or does it aid conservation? So I'm, I'm going to talk to you about some examples, but also a little bit of time on what is uh, these data and that we're, we're, we're chasing after. So, uh, so basically just at the upfront, I'm also going to spend a bit of time talking about uh, the Stone Leopard Genome Project uh, initiated recently. It's a massive collaboration. Uh, but two people who've been very critically involved are Katie Solaris, I think she's in the audience today, and Simon Morgan. Uh, they are part of the program in conservation genomics at Stanford University. Uh, also, uh, Dimitri Petrov, who heads this program. Okay. <clears throat> so, you know, I mean, this is very basic 101 in some sense, but I think we forget it. Uh, so if we just step back and think about extinction, that's what we're trying to prevent. Why do populations uh, and then henceforth species go extinct? Well, I think there's a lot of data uh, from ecological studies which shows us from wild populations that it's basically small populations that have a much higher probability of extinction than do large populations, right? And there seems to be, if you will, some kind of a threshold of you know 100 individuals potentially in these butterflies, for example, where uh, larger populations are, are much, much, much less likely to go extinct. At the same time, there's data, uh, again, mostly from insects uh, that suggests and models that um, isolated populations uh, also have a much higher probability of extinction. So what you see here is as the number of patches increase, uh, when you have many patches of a species which are connected, the time to extinction becomes much, much longer. Okay, So isolated populations also have a high chance of extinction. Uh, you know, this is part of that, part of the reason why small isolated populations go extinct are demographic processes, uh, variations in birth and death rate, environmental stochasticity, a bad year versus a good year, but genetics per se or genetic variation on its own also has a role to play in extinction, okay? So this is a very classic study, uh, again on butterflies and a butterfly metapopulation studied extensively, which shows that butterfly populations which had low genetic variation had a higher probability of going extinct. And there are two reasons for this. One is that when you have a very small population, what happens is by chance, certain uh, you know, genetic variants, which may or may not be good, get fixed or rise to high levels in the population. And this could be bad for the population and it may go extinct. On the other hand, in very small populations, you also have inbreeding or mating between relatives. There's no choice of individuals to mate with. And because uh, related individuals carry similar bad mutations, this results in inbreeding depression. So before we embark on any scientific inquiry, we have to understand why are we doing this, right? So we are trying to basically understand what predisposes a population to extinction. It's definitely small population size and isolation, but genetics per se itself also has a role to play. So why do, would then you know, a species like snow leopard potentially be threatened? Uh, of course, we know this, it's very obvious, but numbers have declined. Uh, are there small and isolated populations? Maybe, we probably don't know enough about that. Uh, and there's many things we really need to learn more about, for example, to monitor movement across large landscapes, to identify if there are small populations and monitor demography in those populations, and to kind of keep a handle on future threats, for example, trade, which would affect the range of the species and its probability of extinction as a species as a whole uh, in entirety. And what I'm arguing here is that genetics and either as a tool or as a value in itself can actually inform a lot of these things. So, uh, so basically uh, that's my, that's my punchline <laughs> that I think that we can use genetic data to really understand uh, snow leopards better. And I'm going to tell you, what is this genetic data? I mean, what is it? it how much is it? Where from, et cetera? 
So luckily for us, you know, like all cells have DNA and so we can read this DNA. That's how we get the genetic data. And if you think about this, this animal, uh, think about, for example, um, you know, when you camera trap an animal, you look at, say, the spots uh, and the pattern to identify an individual. So if you think about it uh, another way, um, so I'll just, uh, I, I'll come back to this. Um, so there we are. So, so basically, uh, we are trying to collect genetic data and I'll get back to that uh, picture of that animal. But I just wanted to take a, a short uh, trip down, you know, history. This is me, you know, uh, in 1997, I, I was working on elephants then. I was much, much younger. And this is me in 2013. That's also seven years ago. And I was collecting shit then and I'm collecting shit now. Uh, and basically what happened was in the interim, nothing much changed. The kind of data I was collecting was absolutely the same, right? But like I said, in the last several years, there've been these really revolutionary technologies and that has changed our ability to acquire data. So going back to this picture where earlier we could acquire a little bit of genetic data, we can now acquire all the genetic data say associated with a animal. And that is what is called the genome, right? So in order to look at genomes of snow leopards, that is all the genetic information a particular individual snow leopard contains, um, it's, it's a huge effort, right? And the first thing you have to do is to actually get one genome, which you use as a reference, right? To then compare all the other genomes to and make inferences. Uh, all of you have been, uh, you know, we're in, this, in the grips of this pandemic, and I'm sure you're reading in the news about all the SARS-CoV-2 genomes, new variants of SARS-CoV-2, will the vaccine be effective or not? All of that is kind of similar, looking at how the virus is actually changing over time and sequencing viral genomes. Uh, but the snow leopard genome is actually huge. It's roughly on the order of 3,000 million letters. And, you know, reading all of those is obviously a huge amount of effort. So here is uh, the, the project that we uh, are playing a small part in uh, with many, many collaborators, um, you know, initiated, spurred by the Snow Leopard Trust uh, and mainly driven by Stanford University, uh, but with many, many partners. So basically, like I said, uh, the genome is, or this individual is like a jigsaw puzzle where you have all this information potentially. Imagine that, If you have, you know, all of this information, if you just read it, like you have all the pieces of the puzzle, but you don't really know how they fit together, right? What in the past, we just had like a few pieces of the puzzle. And that was really not enough for us to, for example, identify individuals or look at uh, movement or connectivity, or even look at more complex questions like, uh, you know, adaptation and so on, sorry. But, but now, uh, if we have a whole genome, the first thing we have to do is to sequence a whole genome and identify which piece fits where, okay? So basically, when you have the whole genome, you not only have more information, but you also have positional information. Where is this? This is part of the tail, right? This piece of the puzzle is part of the nose. This piece of the puzzle is part of the ear. So that helps you say that this, you know, region of DNA is important because it's part of the tail, or this is irrelevant because it's part of the rock and it's not part of the snow leopard, right? So I think that the first step is uh, what we're doing is basically sequencing the entire snow leopard genome. And there's a lot of snow leopard genomes already, but what we're trying to do is to create a reference, which is basically a gold standard genome that can be used then to compare all snow leopards in the future too. When I say gold standard, it means two things. We have high confidence about every single information bit in the genome, and we have high confidence in how those different bits fit together. So how they form the entire genome. So that anything we compare to it then makes more sense, okay? I know this is a little technical, but uh, I just wanted to try and explain. I hope that I, that uh, uh, example worked, that, you know, information is important, not just for itself, uh, for the sake of information itself, 
but it because it helps you understand the bigger picture much better right so basically this is just some statistics you don't have to worry about it but uh, basically what we have been able to do not well not me so much but uh, you know eli and others at stanford uh, have been able to put together a, a much better genome and this is represented by the fact that you know these numbers are um, you know really high so we have a large proportion of the genome uh, than uh, has been possible so far so that's fine but what do you want to do with one snow leopard genome that doesn't really tell you much right it tells you yes how snow leopards may be different from other species or so on but if you want to look at populations on the ground then you really need to look at many snow leopards right so this is just a, a very ambitious and uh, of course challenging exercise because snow leopards are distributed across many many countries many countries have different kinds of restrictions about sequencing and so on and so uh, it's 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 been quite a challenge to uh, figure out where samples are available and how those samples can be sequenced and how the data can be potentially compiled so basically there are several snow leopards uh, which uh, you know are already in process in the sense that they are you know either sequenced or on the way to be sequenced and so on uh, and then basically the idea would be to combine everything together and then to look at the results so this is just a very preliminary uh, results so so basically like i said uh, there's actually already uh, data from uh, seven individuals from kyrgyzstan um and you know they they uh, look quite similar to each other as you might expect uh, and they are quite different from the you know the reference which is basically based on a zoo individual from the san diego zoo now the problem with uh, a lot of studies so far is they almost exclusively depend on zoo individuals to look at variation even in wild individuals right the problem is that for example with that san diego zoo individual we don't know where it is from it's not very clear from the pedigree what its wild ancestors where its wild ancestors were from right it is a snow leopard but we can't contrast it with the samples from kazakhstan to say oh you know it's from india and so it's this different or whatever what we can do already with the several genomes that we have is to actually ask how variable are snow leopards compared to other species and this shows for example what is called observed heterozygosity which is just uh, amongst the number of variants or information bits you have how many of them have variation versus are homogenous and have no variation so it's basically a measure of genetic variability uh, or in a sense money in the bank right your ability to potentially uh, change or adapt in the future to any challenges the environment or whatever may throw at you you could think of this as for example potentially your uh, some indicator of your ability to uh, adapt to change in climate or something like that so you can see immediately that snow leopards have low variation in fact snow leopards have about half the variation of or less than half yeah less than half the variation of say indian tigers tigers in india okay so that's basically a uh, point as uh, 0.08 that's an average and snow leopards is less than 0.004 so definitely and they have much less variation than african lions uh, but of course asian lions are lower right so now asian lions we know are a classic example of a isolated inbred population right so is this something we need to be worried about i don't know yet i think we still need to get all the data and to look at this in more detail uh, but it is Uh, definitely uh, interesting to see that snow leopards do have low variation suggesting that monitoring variation in snow leopards is an important part of their conservation strategy for the future so i was so far i just been talking about acquiring this data right so what are we going to do with this data once we acquire it Uh, first of all if we look at this global uh, snow leopard variation genomic variation and its patterns we are really curious to know how much variation do they have uh, how much variation is distributed between locations uh, and that still all that is still uh, in some sense it's academic i think the bottom line questions are 
what is happening in local populations. So the most important question many times in conservation is how many snow leopards are out there, right? And then once we know that, uh, how connected these pop are these populations, what are the management units, uh, specific questions which may be relevant to specific populations, right? Maybe disease susceptibility, uh, adaptation to hypoxia or you know, low oxygen and so on. And those are the kinds of questions we can start addressing once we have, um, in some sense, developed methods to specifically look at these factors. So now I'm gonna just give you some examples of the other work we've done. Um, yeah, and, and basically, like I said earlier, uh, you know, each of these information bits gives you some information you know, about the snow leopard. When you combine them together, you can get information about this individual versus that individual and how they're different from each other. So, so I'll give you an example of some work we've done. And uh, I've talked earlier uh, you know, about uh, a, a new method we developed. Once we have all of these genomes, we can pick uh, sites which are variable and then basically use them as a toolkit to try and survey individuals. And I think this is a really powerful approach and we've done it with tigers, but that's not such a big deal because tigers can be counted in other ways. In some sense, snow leopards can too, right? Because they have markings, right? But here I'm gonna show you some work we did uh, on Dhol, which is the Indian wild dog. And this is something which is just in revision with biological conservation. But we've actually come up for the first time with a statistically robust population estimate for Dhol. So this is from an area called Vainad, which is in the southern, it's in the central western Ghats in India. Uh, and basically, we actually sequenced Dhol genomes, identified genetic markers which were variable between Dhol individuals, developed methods to type those markers from non-invasive samples, Dhol fecal material, uh, and then went into the field collected samples, identified dholes, right? Had scats which are identified as individuals, used a spatially explicit capture recapture approach. Uh, this is just to show you, uh, for example, what, you know, we started with, um, you know, 344 markers. We got down to, um, you know, 150. And then basically, you know, the final data set still had about half of those markers. So. The problem is when you work with non-invasive samples, the quality of the DNA is bad. And so you're going to lose information. But if you have enough markers, you'll have enough information. So far, we've been working with smaller sets of markers, maybe you know, 15 markers, 20 markers. And when we have variable success in the different samples, it becomes difficult for us to compare across samples. So after we did this, what we found is, sorry, I'm not able to see this. Um, we found that basically some areas of Vainard seem to have a higher you know, activity of dholes. These are maps which show um, you know, higher activity centers for dholes in the protected area. And the density of dholes uh, turned out to be something like 15 per 100 square kilometer, which is pretty high uh, you know, for, uh, for dhole. But maybe it's not, this is the first estimate. And so we don't really know whether it's high or low, right? Uh, only when we repeat such studies across various locations, will we be able to actually come up with estimates and understand where is the density of a species low or high. Uh, and again, from a conservation perspective, how can we change conditions, improve prey-based protection to increase the numbers and potentially increase density? So the other thing which I'm excited with uh, with snow leopards is, of course, that we can do this with SCAT, but also this is a picture. These are some pictures from uh, uh, Jan Geneka's recent paper, uh, you know, which looks at non-invasive uh, samples and snow leopards. By the way, I, you shouldn't think at all that, uh, you know, uh, there's many other groups which have worked on snow leopard non-invasive sampling, uh, including Byron, and hopefully he'll talk a little bit about that. Um, but basically here, uh, Jan shows this really nice image uh, of a snow leopard marking, right? And um, I, I recently we've been working on tigers and we've shown that we can actually uh, use hair uh, to actually sequence whole genomes. So to me, this is, this is really exciting. And for example, uh, you know, Raghu Chundavat, uh, who worked on snow leopard many years ago, 
you know, read about this work and uh, suggested that it would be really interesting to try uh, in the Spiti region to actually sample hair from these marking uh, posts and then try to come up with estimates. Now, obviously, this is a different kind of sample and uh, we have to design an appropriate statistical framework. But immediately you can see that once we have uh, these genomes and develop the SNP chip, or it's not a SNP chip, but a set of SNPs or a set of markers to identify individuals and do population genetics, just as we did in the dhol. And by the way, that the dhol stuff, how long did it take? It took about six months or eight months. So it's not something which is so pipe dream that it's never going to happen. And by the way, there we did it with just three samples because it's so difficult to get samples of holes across range. So maybe it's not the best set, but to some extent, uh, it's the best we could start with, right? So uh, we are in a sense much ahead of the curve with snow leopards and I'm sure we'll get there soon to this, this set of markers that we can use. Another thing which is really exciting is to also look at diet. So for example, uh, you know, some work which we just did recently uh, where we take a scat, uh, we use it, uh, we identify the individual from that scat, right? Which uh, tiger it is, which particular individual. How do we know that? Well, in this one particular park where we work, we have sampled uh, known individuals. So we watch individuals, we sample their hair. And so then we have a database of genotypes of known individuals, genetic signatures of known individuals, right? And then we go through the park and collect fecal samples, come back, and from the same fecal samples, we identify the tiger individual, and we identify the diet using metabar coding, where we look at what prey has the tiger consumed, again, using genetics. So now what we have is when we match our scat genotype to the database, we know which tiger this is, right? And we can then start asking questions about variation in diet between individuals. I think this is a very important question, very much from a conservation perspective. For example, there's a lot of, you know, accusations that, well, I don't know about the accusations, suggestions that, you know, females tend to eat more livestock because they don't want to hunt or whatever. And, uh, you know, whatever, these kinds of things. And we can actually test these things, right? So for example, even just this very, very small data set, I'm just showing you a very small snippet of it, suggests that, you know, some individuals actually eat more livestock than others. Is this true over time? Is this true over season? Can we actually identify, uh, you know, individuals who are maybe habitually preying on livestock? These are important questions which are very local, but very important from a conservation perspective. And, and for example, we know of snow leopards uh, involved in, you know, ma mass killings. We also would be interested in such questions, I think, uh, with snow leopards. Sorry, I keep getting. So, uh, so another uh, kind of more detailed genetics kind of thing, like the stuff I talked about so far is using genetics as a tool to explore ecology. How many snow leopards are there? How many dhol are there? What is the diet? What is the snow leopards eat? Sorry, what is the tiger eating? What is the snow leopard eating, right? That's ecology still. But like I said earlier, uh, genetics is also responsible to endanger or threaten species and populations with extinction. So one classic example which we have worked on is are these tigers in this beautiful park called Ranthambore, uh, which is known as a small and isolated population. So when we sequenced genomes of these tigers from across India, as well as from the small and isolated population, we were able to show that tigers in Ranthambore are twice as inbred as those in any other part of India. Okay, So already this isolation and small population size has had an impact on their genome we are also able to predict uh, what are called deleterious mutations or alleles, which is potentially could be detrimental to tiger survival. And they seem to be close to being fixed or in very high frequencies in a park like Anthambur. So the question is, you know, are there such populations of snow leopards? Will we find these signatures in the genome which will affect future survival uh, of, uh, of, of snow leopard populations. This is work by my student Anubhav Khan, who's uh, you know, um, very talented uh, in, in looking at uh, genomes and asking these kinds of questions. 
Another uh, question which has been obsessing me and uh, is is really kind of a you know a mystery uh, is this is this quest for understanding more about these mysterious looking melanistic tigers which occur seemingly occur only in one park uh, in India and basically because we had the tiger genome because we had the tiger genome and we were able to access some captive tigers which looked like this we were able to understand what is the genetic basis for this melanistic tiger to look this way. Uh, it turned out it was a simple answer. It could have been very complex, like think about the genetics of something like diabetes. It's not a single mutation, right? In this case, it was. And what was even more interesting, now we've looked at 400 individual tigers across range. Most of them are in India, about 300, with all kinds of samples non-invasive, blood, blah, 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 whatever we could get our hands on. And this particular mutation, it seems to be found only in this one population. And there it's at a frequency of higher than 50%. So already you see, you know, that theoretically I talked about drift, right? This, um, that populations will change by chance. Uh, we already see that happening. So we are already seeing these evolutionary trajectories playing out in a species like tiger. Now, for example, you could imagine that uh, some mutations which are important for survival, like adaptation to hypoxia or low oxygen, you know, in a small population of snow leopards, by chance, those variants could be lost, right? And these are the kinds of questions we can hope to answer once we have more information from the genomes. So I'll just, I'll focus, uh, just give one last example and then I'll be done. But uh, basically this is really a fun study that we did again uh, in collaboration with Ellie. She helped, uh, you know, with this, but basically there's this cub uh, which was confiscated, this tiger cub confiscated on the US-Mexico border. And it was a, a three month old, a teenager drove across the border with it, with the cub uh, in, his, uh, in his passenger seat. And uh, the, the tiger cub was handed over to the San Diego Zoo because uh, all tigers have to be, I mean, basically, uh, whatever, it, it couldn't survive on its own. It needed someone to take care of it, right? Uh, so anyway, you can't leave it out in the open either. So it turned out, though, that the zoo can only sustain this individual if it's of known ancestry, okay? So the uh, American Zoo Association has decided to... Uh, captively breed or promote the breeding of three kinds of tigers, uh, you know, Russian Far East Amur tigers, Malayan tigers, and Sumatran tigers. So the question was, who is this tiger? Where is it from, right? And so again, we were able to uh, compare our genomes. Uh, so here you can see, for example, known Amur tigers, known Bengal tigers, right? Uh, known Sumatran tigers, and known Malayan tigers. And here is our cub, okay, which is a complete mix, for example, of all these different uh, subspecies or genetic ancestries, right? So this is the kind of work we could do again to try to understand more about, uh, you know, forensics or intelligence, I guess, for snow leopards. If there are snow leopards being poached, where are they from? Uh, if they show up in trade, where are they from? And um, I don't. I don't know how much of captive snow leopard, uh, how many captive snow leopards are there, but it's also possible that captive individuals could show up in trade and they might look like this, where they're very mixed. Now we know from uh, studies by Jan Janeka and others, which suggest that there are three populations or groups of snow leopards. And these will be very interesting to explore further with our genomic data, uh, because we'll be able to then ask, for example, uh, whether uh, these have separated from each other recently uh, or, or long ago. So the, the goal uh, in the longer term is to maybe have uh, some kind of, uh, you know, these, these SNP panels or these markers, uh, but they should be really easy to implement so that locally people can collect data. Because as conservationists uh, on the ground, we're interested in, in some sense, very local questions. How many individuals are there uh, you know an equal sex ratio of males and females and these are all questions we could probably ask locally we don't really need to know what's happening in china to answer the question we have about snow leopards in spiti right so the thing is though that having that data together can really help 
to answer questions, especially for species which are very mobile like snow leopards, because it's so difficult to share data across boundaries, especially genetic data, uh, share samples. Uh, I hope it's easier to share data. Um, we can actually uh, think of a system where there is uh, uh, something like a server and uh, the data can be uploaded by uh, home countries individually onto the server. And then uh, you could check your data. You could say, okay, do I have a new individual or is this individual match someone who's already in the database? Like I said, you know, we have a database just started for one population. And then you could also try to do various kinds of you know, estimation or inference of connectivity. Uh, and finally, because all of this data is together, it can be used very quickly to uh, address larger questions like that of forensics. So I'm done. Uh, and uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, we've uh, been lucky to have support from many organizations, uh, both funding as well as uh, from uh, several zoos and forest departments in the case of the tiger work and the dhol work. Uh, and I'm happy to take questions. I hope I didn't go too long, uh, Byron. No, thank you very much, Yuma. That was great. Uh, I, I've, I've learned in this era of, of Zooming on, uh, during a global pandemic that to applause, we do this. So if people want to put their, their uh, videos on and, and give them a nice round of applause, that was, that was awesome. It was really uh, a lot of great things uh, presented there. Um, Uma, so thanks so much for that. Um, so, so again, a reminder to everyone, if you have some, some questions for Uma, uh, you can go ahead and write those in the chat. I see a bunch of hands raised. I oh, know that's never those are applauses. Yeah, there, I guess there is that applause emoji as well. So, so I just clarify question... one thing, Byron, sorry. I just clarify yeah. one thing that just to, so basically in terms of the, the uh, what have we done so far? I just wanted to you know, uh, clarify that if that wasn't clear, yeah. we have the reference now right? And we have data from seven uh, snow leopard genomes from Kazakhstan, uh, two zoo individuals from the US, and one individual from Spiti. So it turns out though that it's not like any of them is much more variable than the other. They are all, they all have relatively low variation, say compared to tigers. So far, that's the one result we can really talk about. The others will, will come as we have more samples. Yeah, so, so I don't see a question yet. So I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and ask the first one see if we can get folks warmed up here. So uh, once again, that was, that was amazing, Uma, thank you. Um, it's interesting to see there's such low variability across uh, the snow leopard genome. And I wonder if, I, th I think at least to me, I, maybe it's more broadly known that, that the cheetah is often put up as this poster species of just having gone through some, some historic extreme bottleneck and having low species variability um, with its genome. How, how might you compare uh, the snow leopard to that? Yeah, so I think that the, so the thing is that uh, we have to be very careful about variability because you know this is an average, right? And for example, uh, when we look at uh, say, say uh, tiger genomes where we have say 65 tiger genomes, uh, the average amount of variation in Bengal tigers, if you noticed, is high. But we also see individuals who are inbred. So these processes could be historical bottlenecks and founding events, right? If we did, if you, and I would imagine that snow leopards would be replete with founding events just because of changes in ice. Uh, and even, you know, all of those processes probably resulted in refugial populations, you know, which then was potentially expanded and so on. Uh, and then they may then the, then the human induced bottlenecks say 200 or so years ago onward. So it's probably quite likely that they do have low uh, variability. Uh, I would be surprised if they are inbred, uh, just because I think they move uh, quite widely um, and they still are able to see. Unlike, for example, like tigers in India, there's a lot of tigers, but they they're hemmed in, right? And so we see inbreeding in Indian tigers, though we don't see it in the Russian Far East, where the tigers have lower variation, but they are not inbred. So, right. so yeah, I don't know whether that answers your question. I think those are things we have to, uh, to look at more to, uh, to better answer. Yeah, no, that's great. I, yeah, I think it's important to highlight that low variability doesn't, isn't equivalent of being inbred. Those are two different phenomena with, with different implications for conservation and 
Um, yeah, no, great. Uh, so there are a couple questions rolling in. The first one from uh, Nicola is, uh, how long do you envisage this project will run for? <laughs> <laughs> That's a that's a always a yeah tough question. Where so the thing is you know we uh, because samples were in many different locations, uh, we we were working hard to get all of the permissions to sequence them wherever they are or bring them to the U.S. in this case, um, and so I think it, it, it we are at the point where all of those are ironed out, and so the sequencing itself is not a problem. The thing is when you do the analysis, it's good to do it together with all the samples together. Otherwise, you have to redo it every time. And so I think that um, you know maybe maybe another six months or so I'm hoping we should be able to uh, wrap this up. Uh, <clears throat> um, I don't know, Katie, maybe you can chip in. You're in the audience. If I'm I'm being overly ambitious. Six months sounds great. <laughs> <laughs> At least the first first part of it, and I I think we should be able to get to a, a panel of SNPs relatively quickly. I think six months for sure. Katie, you want to chip in? Yeah, I was gonna say that we. I think we might do a, like like Uma just said. You, you want all the data to process, so I think we're gonna call it um, with the first set of data because there are like a bunch of samples that we think we're gonna be getting in in the next couple of months. But uh, there are ones that I think are probably gonna take longer that maybe we'll hope to get eventually, like in the next year, and then kind of redo it again with them. But uh, as Uma said, like we'll at least have representation from those. Uh, presumed like three different groups already. So we'll get a better idea of kind of what that uh, distribution of diversity looks like. And um, yeah, I think that we'll have some really cool results even from the first set. Yeah, and I think we should, thanks for that, Katie. And I think we should remember, you know, think about humans. Okay, we've been studying human genomes for the last, you know, 10 years. And every every week there's a paper in nature about these other additional new genomes, right? So our understanding in science keeps expanding uh, and maybe the tools will also keep expanding, but I'm hoping that we can actually have, like, for example, with the doors, we were able to do it with very few genomes, right? The good thing there is that we had uh, a very good, you know, dog reference there. We didn't even have a reference. So I think that uh, we, we'll have to prioritize also, like Katie's saying, call it, a, you know, a stop and then prioritize the on-ground tools, which are what is really important for conservation, I think. So that leads to um, sort of transitions to, for me, the next question is, uh, so there's the SNP development, important, needed, but then there's the modifying those protocols so they work with non-invasive samples. So with the snow leopard, it's gonna be almost exclusively non-invasive. So it may be important to distinguish that what you're working with now are high quality samples from blood or tissue that are option, often accumulated from and confiscated, you know, animals or from coloring projects and things like that. So what does the transition look like to getting these SNPs you're building now to work on non-invasive samples? But that is what they have to do. Otherwise, we can just throw them out, right? I mean, basically, that's why I, I highlighted the whole project, because really, that we went to non-invasive SCATs in six months. So um, the only, the basically, the thing is that we can try a couple of different what will be the challenge here is actually because Solepas are in so many different countries, uh, you know, maybe we can getting it to work everywhere in everyone's hands. Now that might be a challenge, but at least doing the first pilot uh, should be re relatively quick because we just have to try it out. And, uh, you know, we can, uh, what we, we have, we did with the tigers too, is that we, uh, you know, we have the good quality samples, which we can always dilute to just make, uh, the amount of DNA less, but the problem with non-invasive samples is it's also bad DNA, like chopped up DNA, right? So we can actually, um, you know, we can we can basically look at gradients of, you know, in the experiments we can do to just make sure that it works, um, you know, and then and then we just go because I think, you know, you have to start, otherwise you <laughs> you keep waiting for the perfect uh, situation. Exactly. And yeah. for example, the we can look even at you know, the, the SNPs that Safia has found, right? And we can see how well they work, uh, you know, uh, for these primers and, and, and basically make the best possible uh, set of markers to go ahead. 
Yeah, no, I, I was going to bring up, yeah, so, we, so uh, a student that I worked with, or she's now Dr. Janjua, Safia Janjua, had worked in developing SNPs from really high quality DNA and where we yes. ran into challenges was getting those to work reliably, repeatedly in the non-invasive samples. And then it just wasn't able, we weren't able to sort it out from the confines of the PhD program. But I think it's great that, that you all are, you know, we're poised to have, continue and push that forward, that effort forward. Um, yeah, so, so I want to, so some questions are coming in. I don't want to ignore this. So, so I'll, I'll Yeah, so while you. you're, while you're looking, Byron, I'll just answer that. Uh, yeah. So I think that, you know, some of the approaches for uh, making that transition, which are based on, we've tried several, one is called enrichment, where you would, you know, basically like pull out the bacterial DNA, which is the bulk of the scat stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and just try to kind of filter out more for the host uh, versus what we're doing, which is multiplex PCR, where we're putting all the primers together. That seems to work much better than probes or enrichment. Uh, it could just be because, for example, when we, we did we did this experiment where we sequenced scat, we just sequenced it to see what it has. Uh, you know, it was just a few scats, but less than 1% of the DNA was of the target species. And so that's why maybe uh, PCR based approaches are the way to go where you're just, you know, pulling out whatever is there versus, yeah. you know, trying to find it in some other way. Yeah, no, great. Uh, so the uh, first question we'll get to, uh, just going in order here, is from uh, Chloe, and she asks, have you tried to extract uh, uh, DNA and getting data from tracks in the snow? And if yes, what is the success rate, data quality, et cetera? So I know, Byron, this is something you're interested in. So maybe you can, maybe you can comment on it. I haven't tried, so uh, I wouldn't comment, but it is exciting for sure. Maybe you can comment. Yeah. Further. Yeah, sure. I can give a, 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 a quick description. So, what? So, the the lab group that Panthera is affiliated with for our own you know, in-house lab work is at the National Genomics Center, that's based at the University of Montana as part of the, the U.S. government um, Forest Service, and they've been really advancing what's called eDNA methodology. So that's where you're collecting and detecting DNA um, within the environment without you know, a scat or a or urine spray or something like that, where you're literally often collecting water or dirt and then, and then targeting that for your, um, your species. It was developed uh, in aquatic systems because it's easier to get water filtrated and, and all that. But uh, more recently, we've been looking at, at bringing those methodologies into terrestrial systems. In the first place, that we found success is with snow traps. The snow is just water if you melt it. Um, and so they, in one of the Lynx projects here in Montana, where they're trying to just describe Lynx distributions and a Lynx track and a bobcat, a bobcat is a very similar sized, um, you know, meso carnivore in the system, or the tracks are often difficult to tell apart even for experts. And then with, even with camera trapping, it's difficult sometimes with that image quality to just, distinguish between them. So they've had success in getting species ID from DNA found in the snow tracks, um, where the limitation seems to be, because we're often talking about maybe a single copy of the genome or of, of a genetic sample within that snow sample. And so right now, just the quantity of DNA is so low that we're not able to reliably get the information that you would want for like individual ID. So, so at, at the current state of, of technological development, we're sort of the ceiling on snow tracks and those related type eDNA methods is species ID, but you never know where technology will take us as things become more advanced so we've, and, we, and we delve into it further. So, so yeah, snow tracks is a, would be a great way to do some quick um, occupancy type surveying, but you wouldn't necessarily get into abundance or numbers. I don't know if, Uma, if you had anything to, to add. Well, I think that's, I think the challenge will be the individual identification and basically uh, population kind of population stuff, apart from occurrence, uh, yeah. you know, and occupancy is a great example. I think that would be a really great tool. And for example, uh, you know, maybe uh, things like uh, temporal occupancy and things like that, uh, change in occupancy over time, those would be fabulous, uh, you know, ways to push those methods, I think. Yeah, yeah, great. Uh, so moving on, so there's a lot of great questions coming here. Um, so Gustav asked next, if, Snow leopards have lower genetic variation than other cats. Does this mean that it will be difficult 
And so more expensive to use genetic tools than for other species. For example, you're going to need more SNPs than you might need for, for something that's more variable. No, no, no. So basically the thing is now we have an open canvas, right? So like if I'm going to have 3 million SNPs to choose from, okay, I only need about 100 to 200, you know, whatever, maybe 500, right? So of course I can't do studies on inbreeding and stuff without the genome. For that, I still need the whole genome. But uh, for other stuff, uh, you know, a few SNPs is enough. And so when you have more to choose from, you can choose the ones which are more variable, right? So I think, I don't think it should be a problem, uh, but I think it will be important. If there's a lot of population structure, that is, you know, those three groups are very, very different from each other or some such thing, um, then it will be interesting to see what is the best combination to use. But those are things which we could do bioinformatically to look at, you know, how well would this set work versus that set. Uh, but I think the bottom line is, since we have so many available choices, it should not be a problem. Yeah, great. Okay, so moving on to the next one. Uh, the question was about, with regards to the work on Dole, um, an individual ID, did you use only SNPs or was that something you, you also use microsets for to, to compare? No, it was based only on SNPs. So we were really going out of the line uh, because there have, I mean, there were, we have done work with microsatellites in the past, but then at some point in my life, I just said, I can't do this anymore <laughs> because, you know, there's a lot of subjectivity in scoring microsatellites and those data kind of die there. Uh, and it's like you pumped in a whole amount of money and you can't take that data further. And for species, which you hope to continue to work on. So for me, for example, I see tigers as a system I'd like to continue to work on and learn about. And I'd like to be able to revisit uh, those data again, you know, in, in the context of another study. So I think it's important to have uh, non-subjective uh, scorable data. And, and SNPs are definitely like that. They're one zero and uh, scored by a machine and not by an individual. Uh, so yeah, we didn't do SNPs, we didn't do microsatellites. And so this paper actually is folds in the development of the method as well uh, to, to basically uh, do this individual identification. So yes, it was only based on SNPs. What we did there was, so the thing which is still a little, um, we, we needs development is how you identify individuals, right? So the this has been developed or ex uh, researched extensively for microsatellites, but with SNPs, you have many more. And so there are some issues of missing data and how you call individuals. And what we did is we collected replicate samples from every scat. So we sampled each scat twice and we calculated the relatedness between those two scats. So sorry, those two samples from the same scat. So we know it's the same individual how related are they? And then we use that as a cutoff to identify different versus similar individuals. It is a bit crude. And these methods, statistical methods for this more rigorous ones will have to be developed in the times to come. Yeah, I think it's important to point out that, that the use of SNPs in this way is still, is still being developed, right? It's at the cutting edge. And so, yeah, of course it'll take time and effort, but like you say, this, this is moving rapidly and, and the work like like in your lab, Uma is, is really pushing the envelope on how to make this work reliably. But you know, we could do a whole semester of discussion on microsatellites, pros and cons, and how <laughs> the challenges, but uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the um, other thing, sorry, Byron, I'll just say one more so, thing. So that, you know, the thing is about microsatellites, the subjectivity is really in the scoring. Per se, I have nothing against them. They're, fab they're good markers because they are quite variable. So another approach which people are using, there's some work on bears, for example, is they're using next generation sequencing approaches, basically the non-subjective ways of scoring, you know, of calling the data to assess microsatellite variation. And actually we are considering that for small cats because, uh, you know, for example, I had a student who worked on fishing cats and we have no genome, we have no tissue sample. There is no way we can move forward, right? So, but we need to know more about the species. So there we're actually considering because there's so much known about microsatellites for cats. And if we developed a, you know, a way to look at like 40 or 50 microsatellites, that would be really good. But we have to do it in a different way, not in the way it was done traditionally. So it's possible to mix and match methods and markers as well. And I think, I, 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 I don't feel like we should, everyone should do the same thing. I think it's good people try different things and then 
we see, you know, this, that's the process of science. We just have to keep changing and learning. Yeah, no, I think that's a great point that, that maybe the traditional route of using microsites that we all know is challenging doesn't mean we should just get away from them, but find a new way to look at them that's less subjective. So um, we have just uh, three more minutes. So I'm gonna try to get through at least one or two more questions. The next one from uh, Athena says, uh, thank you for the, for the presentation. And uh, was wondering about what kind of genetics research would you do for the really critically endangered species? For example, the Asiatic lion, uh, cheetah, Sumatran rhino um, from, from their country. Um, and what, recommend, rec what recommendations would uh, you want to make for the conservation managers about genetic variation aspect of the species? I think that's a very tough question. Uh, and I ask myself that very often, I mean, should I be doing this? Because for many species, uh, you know, there are many more serious concerns, right, than genetic endangerment. Um, but I think that uh, genetic tools can be used to answer questions. So for example, we're doing a project on vultures where you know, uh, the diet of vultures is really important because uh, their crash was initially tied to the use of a drug called diclofenac, right? Uh, so uh, I guess with, with some species like Sumatran rhinos, it's possible that they are very highly inbred. And if individuals have uh, you know, the same deleterious alleles, the same bad alleles, then matings between them cannot be good. So maybe a very intensively managed strategy may have to be adopted in such cases. And then you really need a lot of information. So I, I don't know. I mean, I think that uh, it's difficult to answer that question because it's of course very expensive. So then you have to ask, should you do like genomes of every single Sumatran rhino versus save some other species? Uh, those are questions which we have to ask, but quite frankly, look at the California condor. Millions and millions of dollars have been spent on a Californian condor uh, conservation, right? Uh, and there are people who are uh, even doing, uh, you know, what's it called? Um, the Przewalski's horse and cloning. So there's various levels of intervention from extreme management to uh, pre-management. And I would like to be on the side where we're using these methods to intervene before that level of intensive management is required. But for survival of some species, it might be. I don't know whether that answers the question. Yeah. I, I thought it was a good answer. It is. It's a, that's a really tough question, Athena, and a really good question because we should always be asking ourselves, what should we be doing, and how does that relate to the other, you know, threats to these critically endangered species? Uh, so that, unfortunately, there's an, a number of other really good questions here uh, that we won't have the time to get to. It's now uh, the top of the hour, uh, so I've been asked to close it down. But but please. Um, Let's thank Uma again for an amazing presentation and some great discussion. Really appreciate it, Uma. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And uh, yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks very much. And see you all again soon sometime. Yeah. Bye.